Psalm 118, verses 15 to 29. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he's not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go through them, and I will praise the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous shall enter. I will praise you, for you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, and he's given us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords, cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, I will exalt you. O oh, give thanks to the Lord. For he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let's pray. Holy God and eternal Father, what an awesome God you are. When we consider who you are, when we consider what you have revealed to us, and what you allow us to be entrusted with, our question is the same as the psalmist. What is man that you're so mindful of us? But Father, we know that we blew it in the garden, and we blow it today sometimes, and we needed someone to come. We needed someone to save. We needed someone to redeem us, and he was willing to do just that, but it was all your plan, and Father, thank you that the Holy Spirit empowers that plan, empowers that story to be just as live as it was the day it happened. We thank you, Father, that you didn't leave Jesus in that tomb, that you resurrected him the third day, and that he is now ascended back to your throne, on his throne at your right hand, ever to live, make intercession for us. Father, we thank you for all who are here. And Father, there are many that need our prayers this morning. We think about the fires that we've had the last couple of weeks in Santa Clara. And we think about other people that have lost their homes this past year, school kids, especially that, that have lost their homes. And father, we, we pray that you'll help them. We pray that you will be with them. We pray you'll comfort them. And father, we pray you'll be with families as well. Father, thank you for the privilege we have of being a part of the church through your grace, mercy, and love. And because of our obedience, we came in contact with you. And we get to do this this morning, Father. We don't have to do this. We get to do it. And Father, it is such a privilege to come before your throne of grace with humility and boldness because Jesus has empowered it. Bless us this morning as we worship. May everything we do and say bring honor and glory to your name. It's in and through the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Now, I hope I got us all right this morning. How great is our God is the first song in your notebooks. The splendor of a king clothed in majesty let all the earth rejoice let all the earth rejoice he wraps himself in light and darkness tries to hide it trembles at his voice it trembles at his voice how great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great 
is our God, and age to age the same. In time is in his hands, let all begin and end, beginning and the end. The Godhead three in one. God, the Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb, how great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God, how great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. Jesus, let us come to know you. Jesus, let us come to know you. Let us see you face to face. Touch us, hold us, use us, mold us. Only let us live in you. Jesus, draw us ever nearer. Hold us in your loving arms. Wrap us in your gentle presence. When the end comes, bring us home. Come, gracious spirit. Come, gracious spirit, heavenly dove, with light and comfort from above. Come be our guardian, guide and stay, or every thought and step preside, or every thought and step preside. Lead us to Christ, the living way, nor let us from his passion stray. Lead us to holiness, the road that we may take for dwell with God, that we must take to dwell with God. Lead us to have that we may live fullness of joy forever there. Lead us to our eternal rest, to be with God forever blessed, to be with God forever blessed. If that isn't love, after we sing this, we'll partake of the bread this morning. If that isn't love, he left the splendor of heaven, knowing his destiny was the lonely hill of Golgotha, there to lay down his life for me. If that is isn't love, the ocean is dry. There's no stars in the sky, and the sparrow can't fly. If that is a love, then heaven's a myth. There's no feeling like this. If that is a love, even in death he remembered. The thief hanging by his side. He spoke words of love and compassion. Then he took him to paradise. If that isn't love, the 
ocean is dry. There's no stars in the sky. And the sparrow can't fly. If that isn't love, then heaven's a myth. There's no feeling like this. If that is on love, Almighty God and Heavenly Father, this supper, this feast, this memorial all centers around love. You knew what we were going to do before you created us, you knew what man would do before you created the world. You knew how much they would hurt you. But because of your enormous mercy and love, you created us anyway. Gave us a place to live. Entrusted us with everything you own. And Father, you knew we were lost. And so you created a plan. When you created the world, and the plan was created before the world, to send your only begotten son into the world full of grace and truth. And we spit on him. We slapped him. We mocked him. And we thought he got off light. He deserved worse than he got. And yet, Father, it is because of that love and mercy that we get to go home because we have obeyed what you offered we thank you for the memorial before us, which Jesus took that unleavened bread. He gave thanks and said to his disciples, divide it amongst yourselves and eat it. For this is my body broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. It is in Jesus that we pray. Amen. In Christ alone. In Christ alone. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground. Firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay. Light of the world in darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day. Up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me. For I am his and he is mine. 
with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt of life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I stand. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. Thank you so much, Father, for life. Father, you want life. He didn't want any of us to die apart from you. And so you sent your only begotten son into the world full of grace and truth. And you gave us a supper, a memorial. You took and said, or Jesus said, if you do not eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. That bread to our minds is his body. That fruit of the vine is his blood. And Father, nothing less would satisfy you. Because it was the blood of Christ that satisfied the demand you placed on us. He did it for the forgiveness of our sins, not his. And may we never forget, it is in Jesus we pray. Amen. Ancient words. Ancient words. Holy words long preserved for our walk in this world. They resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart words of life, words of hope. Give us strength, help us cope in this world where'er we roam. Ancient words will guide us home. Ancient words ever true, changing me, changing you. We have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words impart holy words of our faith. Handed down to this age, came to us through sacrifice. Oh, heed the faithful words of Christ. Holy words long preserved for our walk in this world. They resound with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words impart. We have come with open hearts. Let the ancient words impart. Oh, let the ancient words impart. You should be marking just as I am. I come broken. That was another challenge I had. I went, wait a minute, where's the second page? And I like never found it. Just as I am, I come broken. Would you turn to Matthew chapter 7, please?
he's not a member of the church, but he is considered by many, many people to be a foremost authority on apologetics. Apologetics is not an apology for Christianity. It's the defense of Christianity. And he writes a lot of books that have to do with it. And what Josh McDowell said was that 40 years ago, everybody would know this passage. They, 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 they'd say something just like this, John 3, 16. And they'd have it all over football stadiums. And they'd have it, especially when the Cowboys were playing. And, and, and they'd have it, and then other teams. And it'd be John 3, 16, John 3, 16. He said, 40 years later, this is the passage they know now. And I put that first one there because I hear kids tell me this frequently. They'll do something silly. They'll say something wrong and everybody will laugh and somebody will say, well, don't judge me. And my answer is, you already judged yourself. I don't have to. And the idea is, is that people don't like to be held accountable for anything. They don't like to be held accountable for anything. They, they, uh, they will justify their behavior. They will rationalize their behavior. I want to go visit with that young man that killed one of my students not long ago. And I want to talk to him and I want to say, why did you think that you could knock his kids off a four-wheeler, a side-by-side, and then have the audacity to shoot my student seven times. I don't know what he'd say. But I have visited with Christians who have blown it, who've gone to jail. And they would say something like this, I just messed up. You know what? That's right. They needed to recognize the first part in AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, is you've got to recognize you messed up. And so Jesus sounds like what he's doing here in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 to 6, is he's contradicting himself. Well, how can you say what you're saying now, Jesus, and you've been doing this the whole sermon, judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. But why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye? but do not consider the plank in your own eye. Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye and look, a plank's in your own eye. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast, what is, uh, cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you into pieces. Now, again, Jesus, are you being so hypocritical here that, that, that you've been talking about Matthew 5, verse 20, for example? I say to you, unless your righteousness does not the, exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees, you'll by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 23, Doc and I were talking about this a while back. Did Jesus judge the Pharisees? He not only judged them, he blistered them. I, I've had people tell me, well, you shouldn't use stuff like that. <laughs> you shouldn't talk like that. Tell Jesus that. Tell Jesus that. I mean, he called them hypocrites, whitewashed tombs. He, he called them every kind of scriptural that is truthful name. So what is he talking about here? The idea here is from the Greek word, me kritne which is the habit of unjust criticism. Not just criticism. Not just saying, you know, Dwayne, you look fat today. I, I had that first grader I told you a while back that, that she said, Mr. Springer, you look pregnant and you need to lose weight. I've always had that problem. A friend of mine said when I was in fifth grade and I was standing for the picture, she said, when's the baby due? I, was, I don't know. So I'd make the joke with her about 12 months. That's one thing, but how about unjust criticism? And if you've never dealt with the public, this doesn't really, this, you get an idea, but if you've ever dealt with the public, you know what Jesus is talking about. 
this unjust criticism. We used to go to a law conference and, and we'd have other teachers that were in the administration programs. They'd come back and say, boy, I tell you what, you should have heard what they said about you the other day. And I'd go, you know what? They think they can do a better job. I'll stay home, get paid. And then come to find out when they tried to do it, they couldn't figure out what everybody was mad at them about. We had one substitute administrator. She was she wasn't she didn't even have her license yet. And so we asked her to be an administrator for the for a little while because that was part of her program. Because we had a meeting downtown. Let me tell you, we had about 25 teachers walk out. And the reason is because she went in there and she was she was writing their evaluations. One teacher had been with us for 28 years. He says, I guarantee you, he says, she comes back in my room, I'm done. And we were like, we can't let her do that anymore. <laughs> Unjust criticism. Here's the problem that, that we had as administrators. We knew things we couldn't tell. We knew things that were confidential. And if we could have told other people what was going on, we wouldn't have had that problem. Look at the Pharisees. They had the same problem. Jesus said over in Matthew 23, you know what? You go all over the world to proselyte one Gentile and you make him twice the son of hell as you are. Now, would you use that kind of language? <laughs> no, but he was telling the truth. How about Job and his three friends? I had a preacher friend of mine and he's getting ready to move in January. And he's talking about Job. Those three friends... Let me tell you, when God gave the devil permission to do anything he wanted to Job except kill him, that's exactly what Satan did. How would you like to have three of your dearest friends stare at you for a whole week? How would you like to hear that when you're absolutely miserable and your skin's caked with worms and you, you break pottery and you scrape your skin and more, more boils come up from the crown of your head to the sole of your feet and, and you, you want to know why this is happening. And go back to Job 1 and verse 1 when it says there was a man named Job who feared God and hated evil. He could not figure out why this was happening to him. And when he couldn't figure out why this was happening to him, he did what a lot of us do. He complained. He complained. I don't mean to convict you because I'm just as guilty. And then to be told, do you know why you're in the mess you're in? It is because you have sinned. You see, it's obvious you have sinned because God's punishing you for something. And when Job says, please tell me what it is, I will be more than happy to give a sacrifice. Go back to, to chapter one. His 10 children are having a party in the house of the oldest, and he goes and makes a sacrifice just in case they sin. And so he goes, and here he is, tell me what I've done, and I'll repent of it. See, you're arrogant. You're so arrogant that you don't have any idea what you've done. See, you're arrogant. See, God's punishing you. You deserve it. In fact, God let you off light. You deserve more than you're getting. That's why I say the three so-called friends. And then God in chapter 38, you'd think after Zophar gets through talking, I'm sorry, uh, Elihu, you'd think after he gets through talking, and, he, and, and we know God to be a merciful, compassionate, gracious God, you'd think that God would turn around and, you know, Job, I, I know. I know I let things happen, and I know I, I, I yeah, I, yeah, uh huh, uh huh, I, yeah, I hear you, I hear you. Is that what God did in chapter 38? He said, Who do you think you are? And then in chapter 40, 
He says, wait a minute. I said things I don't understand. God says, I'm not through with you yet. You get back on my throne. And he blisters him some more. And you got to understand, we, we criticize Job, but he just lost 10 children. Forget the, the 11 and a half thousand head of animal. Forget the family that abandoned him. Forget the wife that's telling him merciless, mercifully, curse God and die. Losing 10 children alone would be devastating. And can you imagine? Then God comes to him and says, God comes to the three friends and says, you will take a sacrifice to Job and offer it and he will offer it to me now you talk about pouring salt on a wound wouldn't that make you mad wouldn't that get you you know what wouldn't you just be tempted to say i told you so you think you're the one that had all this wisdom you think you're the one who who was cornering the market on wisdom i'm more wise i'm just as wise as you are well, what does job do he makes a sacrifice and I love the way Chuck Swindoll puts it in his book on Job. He says, and the next thing you know, you hear the little pitter-patter of feet. And his wife, God enables her to have 10 more children. And I love the way the Holy Spirit inspired Job to end his book. You know, all this drama, all this wager, Will he curse you to the face? And Job never did. So Satan lost the wager. He ends the book like this. So Job, full of, a, full of a years, full of old age, sorry, died. Don't you just love that? Don't you just love the way he just ends it? And yet, what is this? The three friends said wrong things about God because number one, based it on tradition. Number two, they based it on assumptions. And really the, what Jesus is talking about is the third one, based it on what you think. Based it on what you think. How about Joe, John 7, 24? Did, God, did Jesus say that we can't do any judging? No, John 7, 24 says we have a righteous judgment. You used somewhat of a righteous judgment this morning when you came to the assembly. You judged yourself this morning. You judged other people when you came to the assembly. You didn't pull out in front of them, did you? You made a conscientious decision to stay in your lane, drive up. We were kind of laughing uh, some of you didn't hear it. We were kind of laughing that they all showed up at once. And I said, I'm a little upset. Y'all didn't send us the memo. So you're going to hell because you made a decision to stay in your lane and follow the law? No. There is a righteous judgment to use. The problem is that people think that God doesn't know what he's doing. James 4, 11 and 12 says there's one lawgiver and one judge. Now, Okay, I, I get that. I get that, preacher. Well, let me tell you what. There are things that Church Christ does. There are things that I'm just not comfortable with. This happened to a family member. He hadn't been to church in 30 years. And he calls me on the phone one day, and I get a little leery when he calls me. And he said... I want to tell you something. I was very upset with what happened to church today, not here, but where he went to church. I said, what happened? So said they interrupted the service by getting up and, and talking to each other. And I said, well, what's wrong with talking to each other? Well, that's not the way we did it when I was a kid. I know. Well, what's the number one complaint we hear? What are the number one complaint leaders here from the church? That is nobody visits with anybody. And so they put in a song or two, and then you get up and you say hello and you visit with people for about five minutes. It doesn't take long. And then you go back and sit down and you worship. Well, 
You know, I didn't like the fact that they got up and when somebody came forward, everybody went over there and started putting their hands on them and they all prayed together. And I said, what's wrong with that? Well, we didn't do that when I was a kid. I know. Here's the problem. And here's what Jesus is talking about. Don't pass sentence based on your assessment. Why? Because Romans 14 verses 10 to 13 says we're members of one another. And you get over to Romans chapter 8, which we'll talk about in a minute. And he settles the issue. And so the definition, now the egregiousness of it, that word egregious means the bad part, the bad of it. There was a, there's a house that's being sold right near my hometown. And I don't think the realtor really looked at the picture she put or he put on this house. They want $350,000 for this house. Pretty good sized house, but it was built back in the 60s. And when you look at the swimming pool, look, I've seen dark water. I've smelt dark water being around cows. I wouldn't go near that. It's horrible. The egregiousness of that pool that they were trying to promote is not very good because you got to go clean it out. But aren't you taking God's place? Aren't I taking God's place when, you know, Dwayne, you're not wearing a tie and coat this morning. You are, oh my, what were you thinking by bringing new songs? My mom and I were talking about this yesterday. And she, I said, oh, my dad would just love it. I would show him some songs or he'd show me a song and we'd just sit around and we love to sing new songs. Doesn't mean the old ones are bad. Just means kind of spice it up a little bit, so to speak. Because if you get in monotony, there's a problem. Oh, my, do you, I had, there's a member of the church in Reno's Valley. Every time I get up late singing, you know what she says? Sing something we know. And I go, why? Why do we not want to be challenged? Because if you sing it long enough, guess what? It becomes old. My dad said, don't ever tell people that you're going to lead a new song. He said, I got it, man, I worked real hard for about two weeks on this song. It's core like me with his come gracious spirit. I finally got it. And he said, uh, now we're going to sing a new song tonight. He got up and let it and everybody, boy, yeah, that's great. Except one old lady. And she said, well, Springer, I wondered when he was going to get to it. I've known that song for 50 years. A member of the church told me, said, well, I think we ought to sing new songs. Okay. So I went and found a new one. He said, man, that was great. I said, did you notice how old it was? He said, no, 16, 12. You get, I hope you get the point Jesus is making here. Look, they're not the problem you are. I have a friend of mine. She's gone. She's gone now, but she used to tell me all the time. Why do you always say, I'm sorry first? I said, because 99% of the time, the problem is not you. The problem is me. And I know that's bad English, Jan. The problem is I. Jesus said, why are you trying to take a speck out of somebody else's eye when you got a plank in your own eye? Clean up yourself first. Clean up yourself first. We had a mayor back at home. And he got, so, he got so excited and he put in these rules and regulations and laws in my hometown. You got to understand how my hometown works. It's out in the middle of nowhere. And you need to clean up your, and we're going to find you and we're going to, with all this ridiculous zoning stuff. You know who had the worst looking yard in town? Him. They never made him clean it up. They never, they never sent anybody to go clean it up. And I just went by it the other day, and it's still a mess. Now, do I mind the mess? Not really. Except I'm with the city maintenance guy. Clean up your yards. He pulled out an eight-foot rattlesnake, and he killed it, but he picked it up, and he showed it, 
and he was having trouble and he's pretty stout. He was having trouble picking it. He said, make sure you clean up your yards. Folks, they don't rattle where I'm from because the wild pigs eat them. They are more dangerous today than they were when I was a kid. Clean up yourself first. You see, if you clean yourself up, Jesus said, here's what, here's what you don't do. You don't give what is holy to dogs. Now, dogs in our day and time, dogs are sweet. Dogs are like best. I mean, I, I love what a guy said one time, said, I wish my wife loved me the way my dog does. And, and, and you know, dog, you, you can do something to a dog and a couple of minutes later, it's like nothing ever happened. You can get mad. And now they sense when you're angry and they say, and they get over and they do like this. Even the ones that are mistreated and go to a shelter and then you come to you, and, you know, except Jackie's dog, she attacks me because I'm a male. But anyhow, I'm just teasing about that. Well, she does, but I'm just teasing about that. But but they they sense that desire and the sense that, and it's funny how to watch, you can watch a dog. That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about the animal. He's talking about the dogs that do devour what is holy. Peter, or Paul said in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 2, be careful of the dogs. Be careful of the mutilation. Be careful of what is holy because what, what do pigs do? What do dogs do? They tear it up. Dogs were unclean under the law of Moses. See, when people tell me, you want to go back to the law of Moses? Oh, no. I never want to go back to that. My daughter wouldn't have a dog. She's an 80-pound 80 80 overgrown, pup, overgrown puppy. Even though she annoys me, I still think the world of that dog. She's my favorite dog. My cat gets mad at me. And I go and I see other dogs. And even though Jackie's dog attacks me and Christopher, we still like the dog. Well, I don't know if Christopher does, but I do. But dogs were unclean. In fact, that's what they called the Samaritans, the half-breed. And swine, I don't have to tell you, swine were unclean. And what they would do literally is they just trample the pearls. He talks about what is holy is like a pearl. You remember in another occasion, Matthew 13, he talks about someone going and spending everything he's got on that one pearl. That's what he's getting at here. And you get to the fallacy of judging. It's just a waste of time. I was sitting there thinking about this this morning. There was a young man that he uh, moved to a little community, and I, I preached there for about three weeks, and I taught Bible class while I went to college. And they found out, some of the brethren found out that his wife had went with a friend to the casino in um Lawton and ate lunch. They didn't go gamble. They didn't go over there. And they asked that preacher to resign. I told my mom, I said, that's just, that's wrong. And she said, well, why? He was at a casino. I said, have you been to a, a place where they serve food and they serve alcohol? We just went there Friday night, didn't we, Bree? Week ago. Have you ever been to a place where they serve alcohol, where they serve beer, where they serve wine, where they serve things that, well, that's different. What's so different about it? It's different because what was in their minds. And so I came up with an acrostic. Let me move this so you can see it. Justice ultimately determined guy, guilt. I should have put guilt. There's no guilt at all how do i know go to romans chapter eight you see jesus said judge not that you be not judged well with what judgment you judge that will be used against you now we like the first part but we tend to forget the second part and i assure you it works 
You ever had a friend tell you something? You ever had a friend give you an insulting name or somebody call you a name? What did you do when you were a kid? You called them name back, didn't you? Same thing. Romans chapter 8, verse 31. What shall then we say, excuse me, let me start over. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who's going to bring a charge? This is where Matthew 7, 1 really would apply. Who's going to judge God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? The same idea, Matthew 7, 1. It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us. Who's going to separate us from the love of Christ? So tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, as it's written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm persuaded that neither death and life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of Christ, the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Well, that means I can't tell my brother or sister when they're doing something wrong about it. That's not true. How about when Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 or 1 Corinthians 5, sorry. There's a man who has his father's wife in a adulterous relationship. Paul says, how can you stand that? Because it was the norm in Corinth. How can you tolerate that? You need to withdraw fellowship from him and her. And then they went too far. Because you get to 2 Corinthians 5, and what did he say? He's, he's repented. They've repented. And you won't let them back in the church. That's not right either. Do things the godly way. But see, I, I got to tell you that Dwayne should have wore a tie this morning and wore a coat. I could do that if that's going to make you happier. Give me about five minutes. I'll go get one, and I'll go do that. Go. Uh, you should have wore black shoes this morning. Well, what do you call those? Charcoal gray. But how about when somebody does wrong? How about when somebody says the Bible is not the inspired word of God? How about when somebody says that God hates people? How about when God's... God is going to send everybody to hell but you. We had a lady at Fort Baird. And we went to go get her for service. She hadn't been coming for about two weeks. And every time we'd go over there, she'd be asleep. And that's okay. Well, she happened not to be asleep. And so we went to get her and we said, are you ready to go to church? Ready to go for service? And I don't have anything left of my backside. Because she chewed me and this member out for about 30 seconds. And I told, I told him, I said, let's go. And as we're going to where we were supposed to be to serve people there, She's still yelling and screaming about how she was there before the door opened. She was there when it closed. She was there all the time. And she said there was no greater Christian than her. Now, I'm not making fun of the woman. But you want to know why people aren't coming to church sometimes? <laughs> it's because of that action right there. Basing it on themselves. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 20. Verses 1 to 16, he tells this parable. And the parable he tells is about a man 
who's trying to hire people to go work. And so he hires people early in the morning. He still doesn't have enough workers, and it's about the last hour of the day, and he, hire, and he hires them. And he pays the last hour workers the same wages as he paid the first hour workers. And the first hour workers get upset, and they question the master. And the master says, it's fine. I can do what I want. I can do what I want. And folks, he has chosen to be a savior and a redeemer, a forgiver and a lover. And this morning, we're going to sing this song as a means of encouragement this morning. Just as I am, I come broken. If there is something we can do for you this morning spiritually, we would love to do that while we sing. Just as I am without one plea, but thou had thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. I come broken to be mended, I come broken to be healed, I come desperate to be rescued, I come empty to be filled, I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb, and I'm welcome with open arms, praise God, just as I am. Go back one page. Just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. I come broken to be mended, I come broken to be healed, I come desperate to be rescued, I come empty to be filled, I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb, and I'm welcomed with open arms, praise God, just as I am. Just as I am, I would be lost, but mercy, grace, my freedom bought, and now to glory in your cross, O Lamb of God, I come. I come, I come broken to be mended, I come wounded to be healed, I come desperate to be rescued, I come empty to be filled, I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb. And I'm welcome with open arms, praise God, just as I am. I'm fraud, just as I am. In a little while, we're going home. No pun intended. Let us sing a song that will cheer us either way. In a little while we're going home. For the night will end and the everlasting day. In a little while we're going home. In a little while, in a little while we 
shall cross the billows foam. We shall meet at last when the stormy winds are past. In a little while we're going home. We will do the work that our hands may find to do. In a little while we're going home. And the grace of God will our daily strength renew. In a little while we're going home. In a little while, in a little while, we shall cross the billows fall. We shall meet at last when the stormy winds are past. In a little while we're going home. We will smooth the path for some weary wayworn feet. In a little while we're going home. And may loving hearts spread around and pray the sweet. In a little while we're going home. In a little while, in a little while, we shall cross the billows foam. We shall meet at last when the stormy winds are past. In a little while we're going home. There's a rest beyond, there's relief from every care. In a little while we're going home. And no tears shall fall in that city bright and fair. In a little while we're going home. In a little while, in a little while, we shall cross the billows foam. We shall meet at last when the stormy winds are past in a little while we're going home almighty god and faithful father all glory be to you and father we live in anticipation of going home not here on earth but in the glory beyond Father, we thank you for the privilege we've had of worshiping this morning. We pray that everything we've said and done has pleased you well. We thank you for all who are here, and we pray for those who weren't as lucky as us. Please forgive us of our sins. Please help us to follow your way and to use your law, your, your will. And Father, may many, many people be brought to you. Forgive us of our sins. Keep us safe, and it's in Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you all for being here this morning.